Hey, this is John with Two Moose Home Inspections. Is the air in your home fresh and clean? Let's learn about ERVs and HRVs to find out. Welcome to Inspector Insights. We are going to dive deep into this topic, but if you want the TLDR version, here it is. There are many potentially harmful pollutants that can come from outside of the house, inside of the house, and from the occupants of the house. ERV stands for Energy Recovery Ventilator, and an ERV exchanges heat between the filtered fresh outdoor air and the stale stagnant indoor air. This allows the ERV to pump fresh outdoor air into the house and exhaust the undesirable indoor air multiple times per day without hurting your heating bill. If you want to learn more about it, check out our blog post or just keep watching this video. Our homes are great at trapping harmful concentrations of pollutants. Volatile organic compounds, or VOCs for short, can be thought of as anything that you can smell. A beautiful flower naturally produces VOCs, and your perfume or cologne may synthetically produce similar smells through the use of VOCs. There are other VOCs that are naturally produced, let's say when you use the bathroom, and although they may not be pleasant, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are harmful. However, there are VOCs that are produced during the manufacturing and construction of all homes that can be harmful. If these VOCs are not ventilated out of the house, then that can cause harmful side effects that may be temporary or permanent. Over time, these VOCs will break down and stop being a risk, just like that new car smell that fades away over time. On that note, the VOCs that make up that new car smell that everyone loves is actually caused by the off-gassing of plastics, adhesives, and expansion foam. Most VOCs will stop off-gassing sometime after six months, but SVOCs, semi-volatile organic compounds, may take years. Not really the best thing for your health, which is why a ventilation strategy should be implemented in new construction homes every time. A very common ventilation strategy in Colorado is radon mitigation, but that only focuses on one indoor air quality metric. Since we live in Colorado, which is designated as a zone one by the EPA for elevated levels of radon, the air you breathe in your home most likely contains dangerous levels of radioactive radon gas, which is why radon mitigation systems are commonly installed. You may already be familiar with radon and the health risks that come with it, but if you aren't, check out our radon page, blog posts, or videos about the topic. Ultimately, radon needs to be exhausted from the house to keep the occupants safe. Another gas that needs to be exhausted from the home is carbon dioxide, which is what we breathe out of our lungs every time that we take a breath. The air that we breathe out can have a negative impact on our cognition if the air in our home, office, or home office is not properly exchanged with fresh air. A 2021 study affectionately titled Associations Between Acute Exposures to PM2.5 and Carbon Dioxide Indoors and Cognitive Function of Office Workers, a Multi-Country Longitudinal Perspective Observational Study, found a direct correlation between poor indoor air quality and reduced cognitive function. It is clear that fresh air exchanges can lower the parts per million, or PPM, of carbon dioxide. But how do we combat PM2.5? PM2.5 is either a solid or liquid particulate matter that is suspended in the air, and it's smaller than 2.5 microns. To give context to that number, the EPA has a diagram that shows the average human hair being between 50 and 70 microns wide against the size of a 2.5 micron sphere. It may be possible to see inhaled particles such as dust, dirt, soot, or smoke, but PM2.5 is so small that an electron microscope is needed to see it. PM2.5 compounds can also be so chemically complex that understanding how they came to be inside of your house is impractical, so we should just focus our energy on filtering it out. ERVs pass the air inside of your home through a filtration system at least eight times per day, and many ERVs come with a MERV-13 filter. MERV, Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value, is a rating that goes from MERV-1 to MERV-16, followed by HEPA, High Efficiency Particulate Air Filter. MERV-13 can filter out about 90% of particles that range from 1 to 3 microns, which means that MERV-13 is a perfect starting point for home filtration. Most forced air furnaces have air filters that are MERV-5, which can capture about 20% of particles sized 3 to 10 microns. So why not just replace your old cheap filter with a MERV-13 filter? First, the better the filter, the more air is restricted from passing through the filter. This can be circumvented by purchasing a pleated filter to increase the surface area that air can pass through, but depending on your furnace, upgrading the filter while still maintaining the furnace's heating and cooling efficiency may not be possible. In addition to causing higher utility bills, installing a restrictive air filter may also reduce the service life of your furnace. Secondly, 
Even if the airflow is not restricted, the furnace or AC unit doesn't run constantly throughout the day and night, but instead will turn on for a short period of time and then be shut off for a long period of time. Additionally, the furnace only recirculates the air inside of the home, so even if it were possible to meet the required number of air exchanges per hour to adequately filter the air inside your home, which it isn't, the air would still have high levels of VOCs and CO2. If your home is heated by a hydronic system, such as in-floor radiant heat, there is absolutely no significant filterable air movement inside of the home. If you want to learn more about hydronic heating systems, check out our videos and blog posts. Unfortunately, many homes with in-floor radiant heating systems were not built with a ventilation strategy in mind. What were these builders thinking to build a house without a ventilation strategy? Well, Believe it or not, most houses were built to save the homeowner money at the time of construction. There are thousands of small decisions that are made during the construction of a home that can save money up front, but cost the homeowner a significant amount of money and heartache during the life of the house. These choices result in higher utility bills, uncomfortable temperature swings inside the house, increased number of pests entering the home, issues with moisture such as mold and rot, and that's just to name a few. All of these issues have one root cause, and that is a poor control of air movement in and out of the house, which in turn results in poor control of moisture movement in and out of the house. The idea of a tight house is nothing new, but after decades, the requirement to build tight houses is finally starting to be written into the code book. But what is a tight house? Tight houses can most easily be thought of as a house that doesn't allow air to enter or exit the house independently of a mechanical air handler. A tight house prevents the movement of air, which prevents the movement of water vapor. And since there are fewer holes in a tight house, pests are less likely to enter the home. If the ventilation strategy is well balanced, there is no such thing as too tight. The idea has been proven by projects like the International Space Station, Biosphere 2, and the thousands of submariners around the world. When houses are properly ventilated, a tight house is significantly better than a traditional house in every metric. But if the house is not properly ventilated, a tight house will amplify the issues such as high humidity caused by cooking and bathing much more than a traditional house would. Why is that and how do we quantify it? The standard test performed to test the air tightness of a house is called a blower door test. The blower door will either push air into the house or suck air out of the house. The unit of measure used is ACH50, which means air changes per hour at 50 Pascal. Pascal is a unit of measure of pressure, but you're probably more familiar with PSI or pounds per square inch. Most car tires are inflated to 35 PSI, and to put ACH50 into perspective, 50 Pascal is equivalent to about 0.007 PSI. The 2003 study, Analysis of U.S. Residential Air Leakage Database, reviewed the data from 70,000 homes in the U.S. and found that the average American home had a blower door score of 10 ACH50, which means 10 air exchanges per hour at 50 Pascal. Thankfully, in 2009, the building codes were updated to require homes to be at 7 ACH50. In 2021, the codes were updated again, and they required homes to be at 3 ACH50, with a leniency that was given up to 5 ACH50 for homes that implemented other energy-saving measures, such as heat recovery, HVAC sizing calculations, or an improved thermal envelope, just to name a few. There's also a standard called Passive House. The Passive House standard requires homes to be at or below 0.6 ACH50. A whole video series could be dedicated to tight and passive house construction, but there are plenty of impressive builders that can show you all the new technology and processes that make these houses truly remarkable, such as Matt Reisinger and the Build Show Network. Humidity in the house from cooking and bathing can cause issues with mold and rot, but a house with a 10 ACH50 will have a much easier time dealing with it when compared to a house with a 3 ACH50. So what happens if a house has 0.6 ACH50? Well, if the house is properly ventilated, nothing at all. But if the house isn't properly ventilated and dehumidified, the house will very quickly become uncomfortable to live in and it'll start to decay. The quality of the build is only as good as the quality of your ventilation strategy. There are two main types of mechanical ventilation and they are heat recovery ventilators, HRVs, and energy recovery ventilators, ERVs. Don't let the name fool you. They both do the same thing, but an ERV has the added function of also transferring humidity. To help us understand the difference between HRV and ERV systems, let's refer to HRV and ERV systems as ERVs and get an idea about the basic mechanics. To introduce fresh air into the home, the ERV draws in air from the exterior of the house using a fan and passes it through a filter, normally a MERV 13 or better. 
The fan then pushes the air into the house and the house becomes filled with fresh air. If the house were 10 ACH 50, then that'd be the end of the story because all the air that is being pushed into the house would displace all the old stagnant air and push that out into the exterior. And your house would be ventilated using positive pressure. Unfortunately, as the air is being pushed through the house, the doors will be slammed shut as the air passes by, the windows will be difficult to operate, and during the winter, all that fresh air would be freezing cold and the inside of your house would be just as frozen as the great outdoors. If the house was airtight, the new air would have nowhere to go and the ERV would be doing nothing. And that's why the second function of the ERV is to exhaust the stale stagnant air that is inside the home. A fan draws that stale air, passes it through a filter, and then exhausts it out of the house. Hopefully the amount of air going out is the same as the amount of air going into the house. Otherwise, if the exhaust is too strong, you might get a negative pressure, which would slam doors shut as the air moves in the opposite direction, and the windows would be difficult to operate. All kinds of non-filtered air full of allergens and pollutants would be drawn into the home, and your house would be cold during the winter. If the house was tight, the ERV would be inefficient, not be able to do anything because none of the air is moving, and ultimately fail prematurely. One important note is that an ERV that creates a low pressure condition in the house will undoubtedly create a severe health hazard by drawing radioactive radon gas into the home. I can't make this point any more clear. Radon gas is dangerous. Radon mitigation systems should always be a separately managed part of your ventilation strategy and properly balancing an ERV's intake and exhaust is absolutely critical. All right, en enough about that. The third function of an ERV is to transfer heat from one stream of air to the other. There's something very important I forgot to tell you. Don't cross the streams. The fresh air coming into the house should never be mixed with the stale air going out of the house, but it is imperative that the heat be allowed to transfer. The center core of the ERV has channels for the air that are perpendicular to each other and sandwiched together. The core materials allow heat to be transferred from one airstream to the other, and the direction of heat transfer is always from hot to cold because hot air has more energy than cold air, which means the cold air will draw the heat away from the hot air. During the winter, the cold air coming into the house will be warmed by the already warm air being exhausted out of the house. And during the summer, the hot air coming into the house will be cooled by the already cold air being exhausted out of the house. What this means is that the air coming into the house should match the temperature of the air exiting the house, which is a type of energy recovery that happens during ventilation. And that is how ERVs got their name, energy recovery ventilators. The fourth function of an ERV that separates ERVs and HRVs is the ability to transfer moisture between the two airstreams. An HRV's non-permeable core will only transfer heat, but an ERV's permeable core is made of a material that can capture moisture and transfer it to the airstream with lower humidity. This type of core allows homes in humid climates to remove the humidity from the outside air before the air enters the home. And in arid climates like Colorado, many homes are humidified to increase the home's comfort and the ERV will allow the humid air inside the house to be transferred to that incoming air instead of just being exhausted out to the exterior. The two issues with ERVs that need to be addressed is that ERVs will need a condensation drain line for the condensate that is trapped but not transferred to the air and the correct winter-ready ERV will need to be purchased to prevent the core from freezing as cold winter air enters the ERV. HRV systems are being replaced by ERVs in cold climates as anti-freezing technologies advanced because an ERV system works great in warm and cold environments by keeping humidity levels inside the home different from the levels of humidity outside of the home. An ERV can keep the humidity inside and outside of the house at different levels, but an ERV is not a dehumidifier. One important part of a ventilation strategy that is often overlooked is that a dehumidifier should always be installed with an ERV. In an arid climate like Colorado, the homeowner may want to install an ERV, dehumidifier, and humidifier. It might seem silly to install a dehumidifier and a humidifier, but there are many examples of when this might be necessary to have both. A dehumidifier is essential in a tight house. Cooking, doing dishes, bathing, watering plants, working out, and breathing all increase the levels of humidity in the house. An extreme example could be taking a steam shower after a hard workout every day. An ERV will transfer the humidity from the steam shower into the incoming air, thus trapping the humidity inside of the house. The stacked effect of each of those showers will cause the humidity to rise inside the house until the dew point is reached, causing condensation on the ceilings, walls, and windows. This condensation will result in damage and mold growth. A dehumidifier will reduce the humidity levels in the house to a level that you prefer keeping the house mold-free and comfortable. Let's say you don't take long steam showers, you don't cook very often, and you have no houseplants. 
Well, your house will become very dry and uncomfortable as the Colorado air strips away any humidity trapped in your house, which is why you might want to install a humidifier. The humidifier will keep your house comfortable and an oasis away from the dry air of Colorado, while your ERV still provides you with that fresh Colorado mountain air. But what happens during the ski season when your friends and family come to visit? Hmm. Now, a house that was conditioned for very few occupants has adults and children leaving wet ski gear all over the house to dry, cooking huge meals, taking showers much longer than any reasonable person would take, and then leaving their wet towels to dry slowly all over the house. At this point, your house will become overly saturated with humidity, and without a dehumidifier, your house will be damaged by the condensation as mold begins to grow, leaving you with allergies and water streaks, staining your walls as your friends and family wave goodbye saying, See you next season. As houses get tighter, it is imperative to implement a ventilation strategy that not only provides fresh air, but also humidity and dehumidification when needed. Smart ERV systems have monitors that can control the ERV and other systems in the house. Smart ERV systems can detect levels of particulate matter, carbon dioxide, VOCs, temperature, humidity, and pressure. Smart ERVs can tell you when to change the filters based on detecting particulate matter. Integrated carbon dioxide detectors can increase airflow when you have guests over or decrease the flow when no one is in the house. Smart ERVs can increase airflow if it detects higher levels of VOCs, which can happen when cooking, applying perfume, using cleaning supplies, or installing new furniture like a couch. Temperature sensors can ensure that the house is being properly heated and can run defrost cycles if the core starts to freeze during an extreme cold weather event. Smart ERVs can be used to control humidification and dehumidification systems to ensure that the home stays well balanced. Smart ERVs can also adjust the flow of incoming and outgoing air to counteract the negative pressurization effects by turning on a dryer, range hood, or bathroom fan. Smart ERVs can even be adjusted to apply a slight positive pressure to your house to make sure pollutants like smoke from wildfires don't enter your home through any nooks or crannies that may not be air sealed. The American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioned Engineers, or ASHRAE for short, recommends 0.35 air changes per hour with no less than 15 cubic feet of air per minute. That is equivalent to a blower door score of about 7 ACH50, give or take. Their recommendation is a minimum, and even with the best smart ERV providing significantly more air to the home than the ASHRAE standard, it is still possible that your house could have poor air quality for many reasons. Some systems are installed by eye and the proper measurements and calculations are not made. It is also important to understand that evenly distributing air through the whole house may be great from a number of occupants per total house size, but that does not account for the fact that the majority of the occupant's time might be spent in a small home office and that can end up having poor air quality levels while the rest of the unoccupied house has phenomenal air quality. This type of an issue can be mitigated by having air quality sensors in rooms that can also have the airflow automatically adjusted by the smart ERV. This topic is expansive and we have just barely scratched the surface. Regardless of if your house's construction is loose or tight, you would still benefit greatly from installing an ERV. But as you can see, the help of an HVAC specialist might be necessary. If you have any questions or would like to schedule a home inspection, please visit twomoosehomeinspections.com. Have a wonderful day.